Uh, Joe, let's talk about the Supreme Court of the United States, which has been busy recently, and one of the more high-profile rulings had to do with ghost guns. Yeah, Rob, they, uh, they're they busy this time of year going through the thousands of petitions that are pending in the U.S. Supreme Court and figuring out what cases do they want to hear. And as we know, uh, Supreme Court hears approximately 100 cases a year. Out of the thousands, they they do uh, receive petitions on. And, and I think here just this past week, they granted uh, uh, a hearing on 15 cases and denied over 1,000 petitions. One of the cases that they uh, are, were interested in is Garland versus Vanderstock, which was, as you mentioned, about ghost guns. Uh, now, the roots of this case go back to all the way back to the 1960s. Uh, recall that President Kennedy was killed with a mail order rifle from the uh, American Rifle men magazine and uh, in the subsequent years in 1968 we recall that uh, martin luther king and robert f kennedy were also gunned down and uh, this by, by handguns and uh in, in martin luther king's case a rifle but uh, the congress was was prompted to act on gun control because of the uh violence involving these political figures so in 1968 they passed the gun control act and since then Congress has been regulating the ownership of guns. Uh, And then, of course, in the uh, uh, after Ronald Reagan was was uh, there was an attempted assassination on him by John Hinckley. The Brady Bill passed, which uh, led us to further regulation regarding background checks. And this all all of these uh, actions by Congress uh, were a part of the discussion in this case. Garland versus Vanderstock, because the uh, the problem with ghost guns, which are really fall into two categories: one that uh, a gun that could be actually manufactured at home with a 3D printer, or um, a gun that you know, can, where the components can be bought online or through a commercial dealer, and the gun assembled at home. The problem with both of those types of guns is that there is no serial number, there's no registration, there's no background check. And the concern is that a lot of people who shouldn't be owning such guns, like uh, felons, uh, those uh, accused of and convicted of domestic violence, uh, they are able to get their hands on these guns without any kind of uh, registration or uh, any kind of review. So that's the central issue of the case. And in in this matter, the uh, ATF, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, was attempting to regulate uh, these companies that would sell gun components uh, by requiring that they uh, affix serial numbers and that they uh, run through the purchasers through background checks. The argument by Second Amendment proponents, gun rights organizations, was, hey, you can't do that. That's an infringement on our rights. Uh, you know, you can't require somebody who's simply selling components of a gun to go through uh, what is typically the Brady background check. And the Supreme Court decided that this was a case that they were uh, going to take up and, and decide ultimately, is this uh, a definition of a firearm, these ghost guns, and should they be regulated? The case comes from Texas, uh, the Fifth Circuit. Court of Appeals down there, which has uh, recently got a reputation for running on the conservative side of of issues, uh, decided that uh, this was an infringement on the Second Amendment. And, of course, the government appealed that, and uh, that's what's going to be pending now before the Supreme Court. Uh, Just a little statistics, uh, a further background on this, Rob, Uh, in terms of the ghost gun issue, uh, in 2017, the police submitted about 1,800 ghost guns that they had either uh, acquired through police work, uh, apprehended uh, people who owned these guns. They uh, submitted about 1,800 of these guns for registration. In 2021, uh, that's now over 19,000 guns that are uh, subject to efforts by the ATF, and law enforcement agencies to get these guns registered. 
Uh, statistics from the National Crime Bureau indicates that over 700 homicides or attempted homicides have uh, uh, involved ghost guns, uh, guns that don't have serial numbers or any kind of background registration. So uh, it's becoming a growing problem with these guns getting into the hands of people who shouldn't have them. And uh, that was the impetus for the Supreme Court to look at that case. Mr. Harvey, I'm interested in your opinion on this, as you also have a law degree in the room. You make uh, that will be two of the four of us here. Well, <clears throat> yes, Joe. So I haven't had an opportunity to to uh, read this case, or so I'm just going off uh, what I'm hearing from you. So um, this this I, and I was thinking about the EPA versus West Virginia ruling um, recently. Would that impact the r potential ruling in this case by the Supreme Court? You talking about the uh, Chevron uh, ruling, the one that over that overturned yeah. the Chevron doctrine, okay. because the ATF makes a lot of these regulations. They're not passed by Congress. That, that's right, and, and that that was one of the arguments in the case was that the ATF was overstepping their bounds. And frankly, that's going to be an argument in a lot of these cases involving these federal agencies. Are they exceeding their authority? in legislating in areas where it's reserved to Congress. Now, the ATF, in this case, argued, and I think very adroitly, that, look, we're, we're relying upon congressional uh, acts here. We're, we're relying on law, well-settled law, that goes back to, uh, like as I mentioned, the 1968 Gun Control Act passed by Congress. We're relying on those uh, laws to legislate in this area, to regulate in the area. Uh, what it really boils down to with ghost guns is does these does a ghost gun meet the definition of a firearm? Uh, so we're, we're okay. the argument at first was about the authority of the ATF, but these gun rights organizations quickly uh, determined, well, you know, the ATF does has the right to regulate in this area because of that Gun Control Act of 1968. So the attack in this particular case had to do with whether or not uh, the components of a gun or these guns that can be manufactured with a 3D printer, do they really meet the definition of a firearm? So a lot of the discussion in front of the, uh, the justices were whether or not uh, these components actually comprise a firearm. And they got into really uh, esoteric discussions about uh, projectiles and, and what you're capable to, what these guns are capable of doing. And uh, I, I, I believe, based upon the tenor of the discussions in front of the court, uh, that they are going to determine that these ghost guns, in many respects, are firearms and are subject to regulation. Well, I, I guess the individual components aren't, will certainly not be firearms, but when you put them together, you certainly you certainly have a firearm. So I, I, I can see how that would be very difficult. Like, which part would not make it a gun if you subtracted it away? Yeah, I think if you were just buying a, a uh, let's say you were buying a, a stock for a gun, and that was all you were buying, uh, I, I don't think you're going to be subject to any kind of uh, background check or, or registration requirement. But if you're buying the the uh, the stock and also the firing mechanism and also the barrel, which was happening with a lot of these companies, they were just selling components, okay. and people were buying them and assembling the guns at home. Uh, I think if you buy enough in order to uh, be able to, to uh, construct a gun, uh, it's, you're going to be in a situation where uh, I think uh, laws like the Brady Bill are going to be implicated. Does does this uh, include proton packs? You, we're talking about ghost guns. Ghostbusters. <laughs> it's in Oct it's October, right okay. before Halloween. I had to get a Ghostbusters <laughs> reference in there. Went right over my head. I got it. <laughs> I was with you on that one, Harvey. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad someone was. Joe, right. answer the question, Joe. We're dodging yeah. questions. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I suspect since, uh, I mean, I don't know if that <laughs> technically projects, or there's some kind of projectile from that, right? I mean, it's a it's a beam of proton. <laughs> I don't right? know what it is. You can't cross the streams. You can't though. cross the streams. Cross, I know that. Don't yeah, cross the streams. I, 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 yeah. I'm not sure that would meet the definition. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Uh, Joe, was there anything else you wanted to add to that? If not, we'll move on to another case. No, another interesting case, Rob, that uh, I think merits discussion is X Corporation, which is uh, my corn, one of my Cornby's favorite guys, Elon Musk's company versus the United States. In this particular case, the, the issue was 
uh, the fact that the U.S. government, through Jack Smith, special prosecutor, who was looking at the nineteen, uh, the twenty twenty uh, uh, activities of Donald Trump after the election, he had subpoenaed Donald Trump's uh, social media post, direct messages, Instagram, whatever, any social media post uh, or communication that Donald Trump had that was subpoenaed by Jack Smith and the U.S. government. X Corporation, what formerly known as Twitter, of course, was uh, uh, a repository of all that kind of information, and they got the subpoena. In addition to getting the subpoena to turn over all of Donald Trump's communications that that company had, there was a six-month non-disclosure order, which dictated to the company that they could not disclose the fact that they had been subpoenaed for this information. So Elon Musk runs to the courts and says, wait a minute, don't I have a right as, as, the, as the owner of all these communications, don't I have the right to, number one, utilize my First Amendment rights and, and indicate that this, in fact, has been subpoenaed from me? And number two, don't, uh, isn't there an issue here with executive privilege and how can that be litigated? if there is a non-disclosure agreement for six months. So this issue went up before the court and the court refused to take the case up, meaning that there is not going to be a Supreme Court ruling indicating that Elon Musk has a right to contest the subpoena, uh, number one, to publicize it, or number two, to argue that it's subject to executive privilege and he shouldn't have to turn it over. Supreme Court doesn't want to hear it, so the lower court ruling stand, which indicates that the non-disclosure agreement is valid and that Elon Musk and X Corporation is subject to that, they, they were not permitted and it was appropriate to not permit them to publicize the fact that they had been subpoenaed for Donald Trump's postings. Uh, it, and this, by the way, is just... Uh, harbinger of things to come in the social media world in terms of uh, how these companies are going to be regulated, what laws are subject to, what protections, what restrictions. Uh, Congress has really not done a great job of getting into that area and deciding on what rules and regulations should apply. So unfortunately, the courts are going to be deciding a lot of these issues because there's a whole host of cases that are pending regarding these social media companies. Go ahead, Mike. You were about to say. Yeah, I mean, it just seems ridiculous to me that they can that they're trying to subpoena. If he was on X and or Twitter back then, and he was posting publicly, and then they deleted him, now they want his private messages. I mean, it just it it seems too far to me. It's just crazy. Joe, the, social media is kind of like the Wild West right now in, in terms of what it's ultimately going to become. It's still in its infancy and beginning stages. There was a, a situation earlier with Elon Musk. And Brazil, if he wanted to get his uh, his uh, customers back in Brazil, he was going to uh, have to give in to some of the demands made by the Brazilian government, which he did. And a lot of these other countries regulate these social media apps a lot more strictly than we do. And uh, I wonder how much of that will be influenced based on who wins the election. You know, Trump is very close with Musk, and I suspect if Trump wins, Musk will have a bit more free reign than perhaps if a Democrat wins. Oh, no, no doubt uh, that the tenor and tone of regulation will be influenced by who's sitting in the Oval Office. Uh, but, yeah, it, it is still the Wild West, in my opinion, in a lot of respects. Uh, there were cases last year regarding these social media companies and whether or not their posting of information, either publicly or privately, by terrorist organizations should subject them to liability because some of these terrorist organizations are communicating they're organizing and coordinating through social media. And if the social media companies are aware that this is taking place, which is putting a lot of us at risk for terroristic activity, should these companies be liable? Those cases kind of filtered through the courts last year. Some of them are still pending. Uh, so there's a lot of areas where Congress just has not done uh, the necessary oversight that I believe is, is, is essential to making sure that these social media companies are subject to many of the same laws that a lot of other uh, companies are in media, such as newspapers and magazines and things of that nature. So 
uh, I, and, and radio, I might add. So I think that uh, probably yeah, I think the difference, Joe, is that you know, in traditional media, we control the content, right? So whether it's here or whether it's the Fox News, they control the content, whereas a social media platform, the users control the, the content. So how can you well, how can well, you hold the respect, uh, how can you hold I, the I, company I, liable for somebody saying something stupid on social media? Well, it, yeah, it, it, but if you know that there's a pattern in practice of, of say, the terrorist organization that is utilizing your platform um, to communicate across the globe uh, and coordinate uh, activities, uh, that I, I, you know, there, there's clearly these companies are able to scrutinize content. Uh, so the question is, do they have a duty in some respects when they know this, this illicit activity is taking place? And uh, for example, if, if you're a trafficker of uh, minors across uh, uh, the border in Mexico and you're using uh, social media to communicate with your mules who are right. uh, taking these kids and, and uh, sex trafficking them, uh, you got to wonder if a duty doesn't arise to, to help at least cooperate with the government in terms of providing that information over or to restrict that kind of communication. And most of the time, that's how they're getting caught is by using the social media. I mean, indeed, the, and, the, and the, the government is, is yeah. watching those social media yeah. oh, feeds yeah. and streams. No question. Yeah. Joe, before no we run out of time, let's turn our attention to Texas, where a very interesting decision was handed down. Yeah, the, uh, the case involving uh, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, we refer to it as EMTALA, uh, there, the state of Texas and two medical groups challenged a Department of Health and Human Services guideline to hospitals, which required hospitals to provide emergency care to women who were pregnant. And that care would encompass emergency abortions if the woman's life or her health were in danger due to some complication with the pregnancy. So what DHA HS was telling the, the hospitals across the country is, look, under this federal law, which requires hospitals to provide emergency care to people, uh, that care has to necessarily include an emergency abortion if a doctor decides that that is in the best interest of the patient. Texas and two medical groups in Texas said, oh, no, that's going to violate Texas state law regarding the restrictions on abortion. And in that case, that, that case went up uh, to the Fifth Circuit again, and uh, as I indicated earlier, a, uh, a case where, or a court where there's been a lot of conservative decisions handed down recently. The Fifth Circuit said no to the guidance, said the, the federal uh, government was guilty of overreach there, it could not uh, violate Texas state law. And so no emergency abortions could take place in the state of Texas. That case right now is under challenge before the Supreme Court, and it's going to be interesting because this is the tension that you can see arising across the country regarding the need for emergency abortions. Do they violate certain state laws that restrict not only the patients in requesting those services, but the doctors who are providing it? Uh, we recently had a case here in, in uh just outside of Atlanta, where a woman died of sepsis because the doctors were fearful of violating Georgia state law and providing her with an emergency abortion. And it, uh, that's uh, you're going to see this case and these, this issue arise across the country in the various states that have the most restrictive abortion rules. And the courts are going to have to settle it as to whether or not, uh, you know, a, a doctor who's put in a very awkward position of either providing what he, he or she feels is the best care for the patient, whether that violates state law and what the doctor is supposed to do under those circumstances. So that's a, that's a case to monitor, and that's an issue to monitor going forward because a lot of states uh, are going to be in the same situation as the state of Texas. Joe, take, let's take the, the life of the mother and the life of the baby out of the equation for sake of argument here in terms of what is this doing to the insurance industry in Texas for medical practitioners? Well, I, I think it, it, in some respects, uh, 
it, it might not have a whole lot of impact on the insurance coverage for, and I think you're referring to the insurance, malpractice insurance. Medical malpractice. Obstetricians yeah. and gynecologists, right, yeah. because yeah. they're the ones typically on the front lines here when it comes to issues of, of emergency abortions and emergency care that uh, pregnant women require. Uh, there, there, there's no doubt going to be lawsuits filed where a doctor has made a determination that, hey, I'm not putting myself at risk for criminal liability in a case, and I'm not going to provide this woman services, and she subsequently has a, a, a major health problem or dies as a result, you can bet the family is going to come forward and say, why didn't you provide this care which was medically necessary? And the poor doctor is going to be in, a, in a, quite a predicament deciding on what's appropriate care versus what may lead to criminal culpability. Uh, and, and that's, again, something the courts are going to have to wrestle with here going forward. And you're, it's a mix of civil and criminal liability. Uh, but undoubtedly, and, and I've, I've talked to a few doctors in this area, uh, it's put them in quite a predicament in terms of what they feel might be best for the patient versus what's in their own self-interest. Yeah, I'm wondering if this kind of becomes like flood insurance in Florida. You, know, you can't get it anymore. Uh, if you're a, a doctor in one of these states, can you get medical malpractice insurance anymore? Can you get personal liability insurance anymore? It's uh, it's fascinating how that's all going to play out because the risks associated with you, you do or you don't, you're damned either way. Well, you see that in in, uh, in prenatal care uh, here in, in the state of Georgia, and I'm, I'm sure this is true in West Virginia. There are many counties who don't have an active OBGYN practicing medicine. Uh, there's a, quite a shortage of them, and uh, there's a lot of women who are having to, to travel uh, in their state or even out of state just to get the, the, the standard prenatal care. Forget the issues of emergency abor- abortions. They just need prenatal care, and they can't get it because doctors aren't there to, to provide those services. Joe, thank you. Appreciate the wrap-up this morning. You will not be joining us tomorrow morning on the Friday Five, correct? That's correct. I'll be traveling, and uh, I know sometimes the, the cell signal is, is not reliable, so uh, uh, unfortunately I won't be joining you tomorrow. All right, Mr. Valente will take your phone seat, so to speak. Thank you, Joe. We appreciate it. Okay, fellas.